Hello, and thanks for watching this video essay on subtext and meaning in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. Please watch the film before proceeding further, as many plot points from the movie will be examined. Vertigo is not only a stunning and experimental work, it is a rare and unusual reinvention of the film noir genre, positioned historically at the forefront of the American New Wave movement that dominated popular cinema in the 1960s. With the wonderful costumes by Edith Head, her sixth of many collaborations with Hitch, the first prominent example of a computer-generated title sequence ever in a feature film thanks to master designer Saul Bass, and an opulent score by Bernard Herrmann. It is tough to not consider this film Hitchcock's most memorable, if not the most epic. What do we mean by the word epic, by the way? We often hear this word used, but perhaps improperly. In the context of the film we'll analyze today, Hitchcock pulled together a wealth of talents on this picture, whereas the resultant film could not be anything less. What can be made of the visual dissonance, such as in scenes like this? Or this? Would such gripping images and juxtapositions of operatic grandeur be the norm today? It is not completely lost on any film student that Hitchcock's own anxieties are the anxieties of his male protagonists. And while we can only guess as to Hitchcock's actual psychology, the pattern that he has established in the films we've analyzed thus far have solidified that our director here was perhaps a frustrated artist working out his own role on set as a director and his role on earth as a man. In this film, it is difficult to not see the character of Scotty as a director surrogate. Scotty is Hitchcock. What is going on with Scotty's relationship with Midge, anyway? They were colleagues, engaged at one point in their lives, and Scotty somehow still has access to her apartment, freely showing up whenever he pleases. Notice that Midge does not open the door for Scotty when he shows up, because she is probably used to this happening every day. I wonder if Scotty and Midge represent Hitchcock and his wife Alma in the late stages of their marriage. Vertigo is a blueprint in a Hitchcock's mind. A 59-year-old filmmaker with 45 feature films to his credit at the time ought to have been as self-aware as might be evidenced by his movies. Without being too heavy-handed, as I wish you to draw your own conclusions on this film, here are some ideas that may assist you in your analysis of this strange, often mystifying film. In many of the movies we have studied so far, there is a mother figure. The representation of the Oedipal mother as found in Greek mythology was often a fixture in the Hitchcock film, and the grip this character has on the protagonist, often a male protagonist, is formidable. In many examples we've seen in this course, this mother is often portrayed as a character with colorless sexuality, a matronly figure who holds back the hero. The Midge character even identifies herself as mother, as she comforts Scotty. While she is a source of protection in his life, he wants nothing more than to escape this and confront his demons, as in Strangers on a Train and, more comically, North by Northwest. These male figures, while well-dressed and likable, possess a fatal flaw that is represented dramatically on screen. It can be something physical, like L.B. Jeffries' injury, or something psychological, like John Ballantine's memory. This is the Oedipal hero, turned upside down, as it is in most film noir movies. The hero who more often than not goes out to confront the demon, but comes back empty-handed. Forbidden love is at the heart of the Oedipal complex, a concept that has been popularized by Freud in his psychoanalysis. In Vertigo, Scotty pursues the idea of a woman, but is blind to who that woman really is. He objectifies her in the sense that he only wants her to be one thing. And in this case, it's a woman who isn't real. This creates a thematic clash, a dissonance, if you will, that is underscored visually by the unusual cinematography of Robert Burks. The colors, becoming very unrealistic at moments of high tension, serve to remind us that from Scotty's POV, nothing is as it is in reality. It is a fabrication, and to pursue this fabrication is his undoing. Bernard Herrmann's score here arguably his most famous and dramatic, is equally as grand as the film's cinematography. The notes crashing together as the lovers kiss against a backdrop of crashing waves is a compelling, creative, and stunning stylistic choice. In his love theme, he focuses the troubled nature of these characters down to a four-note theme that evokes the melody of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, another operatic tale of forbidden love.
Even the first three notes of the main title prepare us for the highly dissonant tale that we are about to engage in. I will link to a score video of this music below in the description. This entire film feels like a fever dream of all things troubling. The malaise and mayhem that plague these characters fascinates me with every viewing of this film. How does Judy not know where Scotty is taking her at the end of the movie until they show up? How does Midge know of the painting that Madeline is looking at? Perhaps Vertigo is so appealing because it's got all the trappings of a neurotic's nightmare. It has many of the narrative tropes of the hero's journey. But it ends so tragically and we are left just as despondent and drained as our protagonist at the end of the film. Perhaps the movie's circular nature is that which is so relatable in our chaotic lives.